This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. There's nothing that can ever happen in your life that Jesus hadn't already taken care of. And you know what that does? That brings you peace, but it does more. It reaffirms the confidence that you say you have in the finished works of Jesus. So pay attention to your reactions. Pay attention to what comes out of your mouth. Pay attention to what keeps you up at night. Praise God, because I'm telling you all is well. I want you to look at your life, your family, your friendships, your job, your hobbies, every single piece that makes up your life, God cares about it. And I'm on a mission to show you how to take back the victory in all those pieces, how every single piece of your life is covered under this grace. So join me July 6th through the 10th for Grace Life 2020. Register now at CreflodollarMinistries.org. And remember, no peace left behind. grace-given power to change, the grace-given power to change, grace that has been given to all of us. It is what we need to be able to see change in our lives. And one of the things that I begin to see is that as we begin to realize what Jesus has done for us, how he's made a way for us, how he's already done things for us, and I kind of wonder, well, why is it that some people just won't allow grace to change them? And the answer is because they didn't want to change. And I begin to hear things uh, a little contrary to what Paul taught, and that is, you know, using grace as a cover-up for your sin or as an excuse for your sin. Basically, a person would live a life of sin and say, well, after all, I'm under grace. And, and I, I dispute that. I, I mean, how can you? Paul says, how can you continue in sin that grace may abound uh, or increase in your life. And so one of the things that I've realized is that grace doesn't cover sin, it changes you and delivers you from it. Amen. It changes you. Titus chapter 2 begins to talk about how grace will teach you how to live a sound and a godly life. But this message is not for us to say, well, now that I know about Jesus, because that would, that's what grace is about, now that I know about Jesus, Hey, you know, I don't have to feel bad anymore. And he don't want you to feel bad. I don't have to feel condemned anymore. His grace will deliver you from that condemnation. But if you're still the same, I don't think you've discovered what this grace is. Because if grace will do anything first, it'll start impacting your life first. And what grace will do, it won't lead you to this place of perfection where you say, well, I don't need God anymore. Grace will bring you to a place where you will realize every day how much you do need God. Amen. Amen because it's all about what he's done. It's not about what you can do. It's about what he's already done, and then you deciding to have faith in that. But uh, change isn't change until it's changed. You can talk about how much you want to change. You can say, I, I've been praying about change, but change isn't change until it's changed. And so uh, grace is that God-given power. You've always had the power to change after you got born again. You've always had the power. But I just, I, I meet people sometimes, and they just don't want to. They're just not, I, I am what I am, and I ain't going to, whatever. But you always, you, when, since you've been saved, he has given you, it's a God-given power to see change in your life. And so, uh, we've been talking about that. I think it would probably, since we hadn't been together for a minute, the first step in this change process we talked about is number one out of John chapter 5 and 5 through 6. You got to have a desire to change. You got to want to change. And like, like I said before, your job is not to change people. My job is not to change people. Our job is to love people. God's job is to change people. Amen? Amen. You love them and then you trust in God. And if they, when they're ready to change and when they want to change, 
they have to have that desire to change and then they'll begin to see it. And so we talked about three reasons why people don't desire to change. And, and so we went to the second uh, area, number two, uh, stop making excuses. In other words, a lot of people don't change because they keep making excuses. And I said to you, I think that excuses are nothing but houses uh, built out of nails. Excuses are nothing but nails used to build houses of failure. Because wherever you find excuses, you're going to find failure. And so no more excuses. No more making excuses for not changing. Number three, we talked about actions. Learning how to take immediate action and stop procrastinating where your change is concerned. We keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And we've got to be careful because, you know, there are consequences for what we do. Uh, maybe you, God still loves you and you still love him in the vertical, but in the horizontal, then there are consequences for sin. Sin has consequences in, in a person's life. And then number four, uh, we begin to talk about perception. Uh, it's how you see yourself. And so we challenge you in that teaching to, uh, in order for you to change, you've got to change the way you see yourself. You've got to change your perception of yourself. You've got to stop replaying your mistakes. You've got to stop seeing yourself as a failure. You've got to renew your mind to the new creation that you have as a result of making Jesus the Lord of your life. You've got to deal with inferiority, all of those things. And then I think number five, we talked about never go back. Learning how important it is not to keep going back to the very thing that God delivered you out of. We studied that from a scripture that said, God says, listen, I, 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 I delivered you and healed you while you had sin in your life. He said, so, you know, um, don't, don't tell me that you had to be perfect for me to deliver you. You had issues when I, when I healed you. He said, but don't keep going back lest you make matters worse, you know. I don't know if you know anybody like that. They just keep going back and making matters worse. God delivers them, they go back to it. God sets them free, they go back to it. And that can mean some toxic relationships. He delivers you out of it, you go back to it. He delivers you out of some substance abuse, you go back to it. And in that lesson, we talked about never going back. Turn your neighbor and say, never go back. And so tonight, we're going to pick up with number six, the grace-given power to change. What do we need to do in number six? Number six involves stop waiting for someone else to do it. <laughs> in other words, when change is involved, somehow we, we get into this thing where we're kind of waiting for somebody else to do it. We're, we're waiting on someone else to arrive. I mean, we've got to, we've got to stop that. We've got to stop waiting for someone to, to change before you change. You've got to stop waiting for somebody to, to help you change. This principle is particularly relevant to people that are married and are constantly using their marriage as an excuse as to why they haven't changed. Well, as soon as my husband changes, I'll change. As soon as my wife changes, then I'll, I'll change. Huh? And, and as soon as my wife begins to do what she's supposed to do, then I do what I'm supposed to do. That, you got to get away from that. You got to quit putting that on other people. People often say, um, you know, well, if, if I'm going to change, who will help me? You, you're, you're, you're waiting on somebody else. You're putting it on somebody else where you're changing. What, what do you mean, who will help you? Well, I need somebody to help me. You remember the guy who kept complaining about, I don't have nobody to help me in the water. I mean, if, if Jesus came and said, you're healing me, is that dude, you can roll, roll yourself in the water, <laughs> you know, because you're going to be able to get out. You can't wait for someone to do it for you. God is your source, and he will help you. Say out loud, God is my source, God is my source. And, he is my and he is my help. You must take the first step. It begins, ladies and gentlemen, with something so powerful that we're going to talk about here. I'm really going to show you something about your mouth. And I'm going to show you where that derives from. I'm going to show you about your mouth. I'm going to show you about your reactions. Um, we do a lot of contradicting in our lives. We say, oh, yeah, I believe, but we react like we don't. And we got to be careful not to use our mouth as like a, a magic stick 
So we got to understand this whole deal, where confession fits and, and where it comes out of. I want to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, and, and I want to show you how the heart and the mouth goes together, and if you are ready to, to see change in your life, I'm going to show you how you can stop waiting for someone else in order for you to do it, but this is really, change is, is really waiting on you. Change is waiting on you. You have to be the change. It's waiting on you. You can no longer wait on somebody else. Change is waiting on you. Now, here's what I'd like to start with here. He says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. Now, according to this scripture, notice what comes first. He says, believe first, and notice that speaking comes as a result of, your, of what you believe. In other words, what you say is going to be based on what you believe. So, so likewise, when, <laughs> when you say something that's in unbelief, you, you, you've told me what you don't believe. <laughs> because uh, I believe and therefore I speak. So we have to spend more time when it comes to change evaluating what is it that we believe. Do we believe in the blood of Jesus? Do we believe that grace uh, has given us the power to change? Do we believe? Because if you don't believe that, it's a sounding board. All we have to do is listen to you, and that becomes authentic evidence of what you believe. I preach that to myself sometimes when when something happens in my life and it, it moves me emotionally, I, I preach that. I, I say to myself, if you really believed, then why are you reacting like this? You understand what I'm saying? If you, your, your reaction doesn't indicate that you really believe. And, and, and before I hold anybody else responsible for it, I want to hold myself responsible for it. You're laying up in bed and you can't go to sleep and you call yourself a believer. And I'm like, Creflo Dollar, if you really believed, you would be snoring right now. What's up? What's the problem? So it, when I find that I have a belief issue, I'm going to do one of two things. Number one, I'm going to call a fast if it's that bad. Or number two, I'm going to spend more time in the Word on whatever I'm having problems believing. Though a word deficit will allow you to be ruled by your emotions instead of being led by the Spirit of God. And so I'm always challenging myself with that, and it, it appears like it's getting a lot better. There's things that are happening, and I say, okay, just a small adjustment needed. Praise God, we're all right. That's indicating my heart now is in the right place. I believe in the finished works of Jesus Christ. I believe it's done. I believe he's perfecting everything that concerneth me. And so my responses will become evidence of what I believe. Well, because I'm a human, sometimes something happens that completely blows my mind, and, and I'm just blown away because something like that happened, but then I have to still train myself and say, you know what, even though that happened, it's cool, no problem. I used to freak out when I was raising my girls. I forgot which one it was, but we had just moved, and she decided to take a, a black ink uh, pen and just start drawing on the walls. I couldn't believe it. I thought, what in the world? And I'm like, well, she's a kid. She don't know. You didn't give me paper, so I used a wall. And she drew on the walls, and she drew on the door and all that. And, and, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm treating it like it is, it is permanent damage. It's not permanent damage. Paint. It's no big deal. Paint. There's nothing in the house. I'm sure you guys had folks over for Christmas and stuff like that. They were running everywhere. And I had to tell myself, now, if, if I didn't want them somewhere, I had a lot to do. <laughs> My little man cave, I locked the door on that one. So, can we please get in? No. <laughs> My mama, me and mama, nothing tell us no. That, that ain't going to open today, baby. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't going to open today. And, and I just had to tell myself, there is nothing that can happen that cannot be taken care of. You know, the same thing is true about our lives. Whatever happens in your life, there's nothing that can ever happen in your life that Jesus hadn't already taken care of. And you know what that does? That brings you peace 
but it does more. It reaffirms the confidence that you say you have in the finished works of Jesus. So pay attention to your reactions. Pay attention to what comes out of your mouth. Pay attention to what keeps you up at night. Praise God, because I'm telling you, all is well. And it will be evidence in how you choose to react. So we're no longer just talking about a bunch of church folks saying, you know, you know, religious sayings. Oh, yes, brother, I believe, and just let something happen. Then all of a sudden it's gone. Oh, I have the joy of the Lord. Go outside and see a flat tie, and you'll lose your joy in a moment. Amen? That's, listen, this, these things are not being said to you to bring about condemnation or make you feel, feel bad. These things are being said to you so you can constantly remind yourself of your greater need for Jesus every day. I don't want to ever stand up here in perfection where I have no need for him. If I could ever stand up here with perfection where I have no need for him, I'm in a bad place. I always want to be in a place where I can look at my life and say, I need you here, I need you here, I need you, I need you, I need you. I want to need him all the time. That's powerful right there. That's a powerful place to be in where you need him. So notice he says, believe first, and then speaking comes as a, as a, as a fruit of what you believe, in a sense. Speaking comes as an offspring of what you believe. I'm trying to challenge you versus, well, I'm going to say it 50 times, and then I'm going to make something happen. And you're saying something 50 times that ain't even in your heart one time. You follow what I'm saying? You're saying it 50 times, but it ain't in your heart one time. You're praying that if I can say it enough, it'll get in my heart. And there's a way where speaking is called a form of meditating the Word, and meditating the Word day and night. And you can, when you speak the Word, you meditate the Word, so that, that has a place. But I want you to understand your heart condition will determine your confession harvest. Because all confession is, is bringing what's in your heart out. So if, there's, if it's not in the heart, when you say it, we, we, you, just, you just transferred the reality of what's really in your heart. Because the heart is kind of like the fishing line that you throw in the pond, you reel it back up. It's on, you're only going to catch what's in the pond. I said you're only going to catch what's in the pond. And so that's a form of admitting something. So I want to look at that tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. This issue of it being in my heart, because I believe with all my heart that we don't need to wait on somebody else to do it for us. We have the ability, grace has given us the ability to change. This is very interesting here in verse 20, 34. He says, oh, generation of vipers. Boy, that's hard. <laughs> Called you snakes. How can you being evil, this is a very interesting question, how can you being evil speak good things? Listen to what he's saying. He said, how, how can you be evil and speak good things? He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, what, what works out of the abundance of a heart? The mouth. The mouth is only speaking out of the abundance of the heart. So the abundance of your heart really generates the honest confession of your mouth. You know, I told you that speaking can be a form of meditation to get it in your heart, but you can't confuse the two. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth is going to speak the truth of your heart. The mouth is going to speak the truth of your heart. And, and something I says, well, how will I know? When the pressure is applied, what's in you is going to flow out. You want to get juice out of an orange? Put pressure on it. What's ever in the orange is what's going to come out. And that's where we got to be successful, is when the pressure comes on, the right kind of juice has got to come out. But look what he says in the next verse. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, verse 35. He says, a good man out of the good treasures of the what? Heart, what does he bring forth? Bring forth good things. Your confession is what brings it forth. It brings forth. You bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth what? Evil, evil things, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. The main ones is I wanted you to see the mechanics of heart-mouth connection. That evil heart, good heart, the mouth speaks out of the heart. 
I like the way I just said that. The mouth speaks out of the heart. The mouth speaks out of the heart. You need to write that down. That's a really, you know, I told you before, most of the time I'm teaching, I'm searching for the, art, the right way to articulate something that I'm seeing. And the mouth speaks out of the heart, out of the things of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's simply saying to us, if we want to change, and I've been trying to say this a lot of different ways, we've got to see change inwardly. It's got to be genuine change. It's got to be authentic change. It's got to be the change that comes as a result of your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, your genuine relationship with God. Not you're going to church, that's cool, that's helpful, that can be a part of the itinerary, but it's really that everyday relationship that you have with God for no benefits at all. You're not having the relationship so you can show out. You're not having the relationship so you can prove you're this great Christian. You're not having a relationship where you got to do everything in the open to be seen. You can do things in the closet because you have a personal relationship with him and you ain't, you ain't, you ain't got to try to prove that to nobody. Then that which is in your heart never has the need for any validation. Because anytime you do something out of your heart, validation is not needed. It's only when you are mechanically doing something that's not in your heart in the first place that you need validation to try to help you prove that you kind of believe what you really don't. Whew. And we're living in a society and a generation that people are doing all kinds of things just to buy validation. Do you know, you know how you're going to feel one day when you wake up and you don't care about nobody's validation except the Father's? You are going to walk in a level of freedom that is going to freak people out. They're going to be doing and say, saying stupid stuff about you, and you're just going to be smiling and saying, how you doing? That? What, what, you're, okay. It ain't going to bother you a bit, man. It's a freedom. It's a freedom. It's taken me time to get to that place of freedom. I just didn't know people were so mean. I didn't know Christians were so mean. And I didn't know church folks were meaner than unsaved folks. There were folks that, did, that, had, that were full of the devil that treated me nicer than some Christian folks did. And I was shocked. But I tell you what, man, now I see what Jesus was saying, that one of the greatest deliverance we can have is deliverance from people so that you're never changing for anybody. You're changing because of the relationship you have with Jesus is what's giving you the desire to want to be more like him. Amen. Let's, uh, let's look at this scripture, Proverbs chapter 4, 23. And, and um, man, I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited about my relationship with, with, with God. Change is near you. Say that out loud. Change is near me. Change is near me. Now, um, first, first four, that's, uh, verse 23, he says, he says, keep thy heart. Another translation says to guard your heart. Wow, to guard it as if you place guards in front of a gate to guard your property from intruders. That was the intent here, to guard your heart or to keep your heart with all diligence for out of your heart are the what? The, the issues, the issues of oh, Everybody got issues, right? He is saying that those issues come out your heart. I heard somebody say, no, no, everybody got issues. I dare you to, to I can prove it to you. Everybody got an issue. <laughs> and, and it might not be one of them big issues, you think, but it, it ain't no big or little issues. You got issues. You might be sweet as you want to, but you just talk too much. <laughs> everybody have issues. That's why I, we, we all, this, see, this is the thing. We need a savior to help us with all our issues. <laughs> now think about it. If, if nobody had issues and we were flawless and perfect, we wouldn't need a Savior, and Jesus would completely wasted his time shedding his blood and going through that whole deal. And I am learning how to unashamedly go, and go before God and, 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 and share my issues, whichever one I have that day, to say, Lord, I thank you that you've already finished the work for my issue. Now I reach out with faith and I receive it. Now let me examine my heart. See, what we do sometimes, we kind of get up and you have a conversation or a situation. It's all about relationships, right? And out of those relationships, you walk out and you're talking about, I feel some kind of way. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something going on with the person you just had an encounter with. A lot of times you'll be shocked 
that when you feel in some kind of way, it's some unresolved heart issue. Are you tired of going through the motions and never seeing results in your life? It's time to embrace the positive change God wants for you. The seven message series, Changed by Grace, is designed to help you finally see lasting results. For a love gift of $40 or more, you can receive the entire series. The most important thing a born again person do is to renew your mind. Why? So you can see Jesus. Every study time, I see him more. Every prayer time, I see him more. You're being transformed every time you see him more. And one day you're gonna look at him and you're gonna look just like him. Jesus provided everything I need. He died on the cross so I, I would have everything that I need today and I don't have to do anything but just believe. Or for just $55, you can also receive a four message series, New Depths in the Holy Spirit. In this series, you'll learn how to cultivate a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Call today or visit the website below to order. I want you to look at your life, your family, your friendships, your job, your hobbies, every single piece that makes up your life, God cares about it not just your Sunday morning life. He came that every piece would be good, that every single piece would be covered with his love, with his favor. That's what it's all about. It's about you understanding that he's involved in every piece. Yes, he gave you salvation, but this life, this grace life, it's about the whole thing. It's about your flourishing in every piece of your life, not just on Sunday morning because he's not just a Sunday morning kind of God and I'm on a mission to show you how to take back the victory in all those pieces. How every single piece of your life is covered under this grace. So join me July 6th through the 10th for Grace Life 2020. Register now at CreflodollarMinistries.org and remember, no peace left behind. Creflo Dollar Ministries refuses to turn a blind eye to human suffering. God has given us the power and the means to meet the needs of people in a hands-on, tangible way. Rest assured that your financial donations are hard at work in the lives of people both here and abroad. We know that when people understand grace, they're empowered to change their lives for the better. Your support enables us to share God's grace with the people Jesus died to save. Thank you. Thank you for choosing to be a blessing in the lives of other people by sending in your financial donations to this ministry. If you'd like to give now, you may do so by calling in or giving online at creflodollarministries.org. Thank you and God bless you. Your generosity allows us to make a difference in the lives of people all over the world. Through Creflo Dollar Global Missions, we are providing food, clothing, crucial supplies, and the Word of God to people in the most remote regions of the world. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.